Good evening. My name is Ed McCartan, and I've been a financial services industry professional since 1974 when I uh, was able to join the fledgling Chicago Board Options Exchange as an independent floor trader and then moved on and became a member of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Between those two exchanges, I spent 10 years of my career. The remaining 20 were spent in larger financial institutions like Solomon Brothers, J.P. Morgan, and Robertson Stevens, a West Coast investment bank that was owned by a large regional bank here in the Northeast. The purpose tonight of my presentation is to talk about this concept of too big to fail and how Wall Street banks have effectively created risk not only to the United States but also to the global economy. We might be the 99%, but this is what the 1% looks like. I find something very disturbing about this expression, too big to fail. It's become a meme in the press, and yet it's simply four monosyllabic words that don't convey anything like what the bigness of big actually means or what the potential to fail means for, for our global economy. Why are these banks too big to fail? Let's talk a little bit about their scale. This graph is a chart of the share of total profits that are held by financial intermediaries in the United States economy. It's not solely banks. This does include uh, mutual fund managers, and commodity traders, but the giant share of financial industry profits are commercial banks. This does not include investment banks. And what you'll notice about this chart is that in the post-World War II period, here at December 1947, largely for the next 45, 35 to 45 years, you'll see that the share of all profits that are held by financial institutions basically oscillate around 12%. In recessions, in recessionary periods, it gets down to 8 or gets down to about 10.5%, to a high of perhaps 20% in the good times of recovery. Then, in the 1981 and 82 recession, one of the bigger ones that we've had recently, we've gotten to the point where the Reagan revolution begins to happen. Reagan comes to power with a powerful message that in order to spur innovation and job creation, that we needed to begin to deregulate all aspects of regulation of American industry, whether that be the banking system, manufacturing, all kinds of things that might restrict the growth of corporate profits. And suddenly, there's an escalation in the kind of returns that financial institutions are beginning to make. And you see it in this very sharp upward movement north of 32% at its first peak. This also coincides with the dramatic building of new markets primarily involving swaps. And in order for you to understand the magnitude of this problem, I'm going to digress very briefly to talk to you about what swaps are and how unique they are in terms of the overall risk to the economy. As you can see, shortly before the complete unwind of the dot-com bubble in 2001, and of course the, the attacks on the United States in September of that year, we reached a peak of 46% of all corporate profits were coming from financial institutions. Obviously, the crash of 2008 caused this massive downward spike because financial institutions were being punished severely. But look, in a very short period of time, they've already come back to nearly 30% of all corporate profits, and they're on the upswing again, far, far above the historical norm that we've seen in the 12 to 16% region. Not only is the share 
of corporate profits being concentrated in this industry worrisome. It's also the concentration. Because in the wake of that disaster that we had in September of 2008, the weak institutions had to be taken up by stronger ones or their liquidation would have set off repercussions throughout the domestic and international system. These firms were combined. They were rolled up, as they say, into stronger institutions. Bank of America took over Countrywide Financial, the mortgage company. Uh, they, also, um, uh, they also bought Merrill Lynch. Bear Stearns was taken over by J.P. Morgan Chase. And one by one, the weak links in the system had to be taken over into stronger hands. What's the result? The four largest banks in the United States, J.P. Morgan Chase, Bank of America, Citigroup, and Wells Fargo, now control 60% of the assets in the banking industry. And to those who are in the banking system, assets means loans. All loans, consumer, commercial, industrial, municipal, all of these points of finance. When we think about these banks and the way that they touch us, it's a light touch. We think of them as having our checking account. You might have a student loan. You have a credit card with them, or the debit card with them, and you interact with them at a local branch or an ATM. But the scope of the banking industry is so much broader and it straddles virtually all commercial interactions in the United States because they lend to corporations and they finance them through underwriting, powers that they didn't have a decade ago. They do the same thing for municipalities and for states. They do the same thing for consumers with car loans and mortgages and student loans. They tax you every time that you use a debit or credit card with transaction fees that ultimately come out of your pocket but are generally being paid by the merchants that you do business with. And they control brokerage in the commodity markets, in equity markets. They are bond dealers. They help to finance the United States government every single week. And most importantly, they run swaps markets. So generally, you'll hear people say to you that Wall Street is far too complex for individuals to be able to understand. That is not the case. Most of the stuff is simple math. It can be more complex, but at its root, they're fairly simple concepts. So to help you understand what a swap is, let's talk first about markets that you're probably a lot more familiar with. Exchange traded securities transactions, stock trading. On the floors of exchanges like the New York, you have a buyer and a seller, a buyer and a seller meet conduct a trade, and then the operating within a regulated exchange with a readily available secondary market. If you buy your shares and you're unhappy with them, you can turn around and sell them. No one's obligating you to hold those stocks indefinitely. You have a centralized clearinghouse so that when the buyer makes the transaction, before the opening of business tomorrow morning, cash runs into the clearinghouse, the seller's shares come into the clearinghouse, they are exchanged, and the ensuing cash is in the seller's account, and the stock is in the buyer's account. So at the process ends, each party has residual market risk. If I bought a stock and it goes down, I lose. If it goes up, I make money. But I never see the seller again. The transaction is finished, it's over with. Now let's compare that to what happens in a swap transaction. First of all, it's important to recognize that these are OTC swaps, over-the-counter swaps, which means that they are not conducted on an exchange. They are conducted between two willing counterparties. And essentially, a swap is what it sounds like. The two counterparties are making an agreement to exchange one particular asset for another or a particular rate of return for another. The most common sorts of swaps that exist 
or interest rate swaps or currency swaps. And that's the way those markets began. And they began in the banks because banks were the traditional dealers in interest rates and in currency transactions. But as time went on, they became a lot more complex. And now you can trade swaps in oil, in corn, in wheat, in the German stock index. If you can conceive of an asset having a non-manipulable, available price, if you can witness that price, you can make a swap out of it. It's not particularly hard to do. However, unlike a stock transaction where you make the trade and you pay for it by 9.30 tomorrow morning, these transactions are set up for a term that's agreed upon between the two parties. And typically swaps tend to be longer dated instruments, six months, a year, five years, or even longer. The important point is to remember is that these are entirely customized transactions. Every one is different than the other one, and that has real consequences. They're non-standardized. If you and I make a swap contract, it will be not it will be unsaleable in its original form back to the individual party that contracted in it to begin with. The market is also very, very lightly regulated. It's nothing like the level of scrutiny that would happen in markets that are governed by the Securities and Exchange Commission or by the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. Lots of rules, lots of regulations, not so in this market. And as a result, because of the long time exposure of these contracts, you have credit risk. And by that I mean that the two parties have to be a little concerned that at the end of the contract, when it's time to settle up, that the seller or the buyer has the wherewithal to make good on the transaction. And that is a leap of faith. Remember, the word credit comes from the word to believe. So let me give you a quick and very simple example of a swap, and then we'll move on to why this creates enormous global risk. Here's a basic OTC swap transaction in currency. Let's say that counterparty A is about to build a paper mill in Canada. He's got to buy materials in Canada, he's got to employ construction workers in Canada, and he runs the risk that if the Canadian dollar starts going up, the cost of his project is going to get more and more expensive. He can hedge that risk of an appreciation of the currency by making an agreement to receive Canadian dollars and return payout in US dollars. So he finds a willing counterparty who's willing to do exactly the opposite. Counterparty B pays Canadian and receives US. All right, now let's say that each party knowingly gets involved, knowing that there are these risks. They have market risk. Counterparty A, who's receiving Canadian dollars, is going to lose money if the Canadian dollar falls, and counterparty B will make money, and vice versa. So there's market risk, just like there is in most transactions. The difference here is that there's also credit risk, because for as long as this contract is outstanding, these two parties are tied together in a financial relationship that only ends when the swap reaches its termination date. And finally, unlike securities, there's no secondary market to trade in. You can't decide, I don't like being in this position anymore and get out of it by making a telephone call. What you do to get out of it is to get in to an opposing swap. So in this particular case, you have to bring in a new counterparty. And that's counterparty C. If counterparty A wants to get out of his position, he's got to get counterparty C to take it. So this third um, counterparty is receiving Canadian just like counterparty A did. 
and the market risk for counterparty A is gone. He's out. He's going to make this transaction so that the swap end date is exactly the same as the swap end date, end date of the first transaction. So his market risk is gone, but counterparty A has credit risk to counterparty C, and he has credit risk to counterparty A for the entire lifetime of now two swaps. You can imagine then that very quickly, because there is no secondary market for these highly customized instruments, that the book of swaps among all market participants grows and grows and grows. Well, how big is that growth? Let's try and put a number on that. But in order to get to that, we have to talk about a really big number. We have to talk about the gross domestic product of the United States. Last year, the GDP of the United States was $13 trillion. And that was about one-fifth of the global output of $58 trillion the year before. To give you a perspective of how big the bank swap market is, keep that number $58 trillion in mind, and recall that the notional value of the swaps portfolio of the Bank of America is $53 trillion. One bank. One bank. And remember, Bank of America d conducts a swaps business not only in the United States, they're in Canada, they're in all the European countries, they're in Tokyo, they're in Hong Kong, they're in all the major financial capitals of the world through their various subsidiaries. So when you think about this example, this simple three swap transaction I showed you before, think of how this grows and grows and grows as people enter market risk and remove market risk, they always leave credit risk behind. So this is what I meant earlier about how innocuous the word big is. What's big? Is it the Hudson Valley? Is it the Grand Canyon? Let's take a look at how big this market is. The notional value of the global swaps outstanding is $1.14 quadrillion, or 20 times global output. When you think about what would happen if there were a systemic problem in swaps, the normal solution to it would be central bank intervention. You could have the central bank intervene. It could prop up these banks, as the Fed did in 2008. You could think about raising taxes to be able to support the central bank. You could think about reducing your budget and having complete austerity to try and shrink the costs of government, all to benefit a complete blow up in the commercial banking system. But seriously, if we're talking about 20 times GDP, those traditional remedies don't sound like they're going to work to me. Now in fairness, I have to say and any derivatives trader would say to you, this is not the real number. This is the notional value. By that I mean you simply take all the swaps that exist, you take their nominal size, and you add them up to get this total. Derivatives dealers and their industry group would say, there's no need to worry about this because, as you see, many of these transactions are offsetting where you know, one party has market risk, he's neutralized that market risk. So you have to net this down, and it becomes a much, much smaller number. That is a very small concern to me, because there's credit risk that remains of that amount. And that kind of credit risk could be overwhelming. When we had the, the 2008 crisis, one of the reasons that it spread so rapidly is there's a system of payments and flows back and forth. And there is a temptation that if your counterparty is beginning to fail and you owe them money, you're not going to want to make a payment to them until you've collected everything that they have to pay to you. That's only natural, right? 
you want to be paid first, and only then will you pay them. And to the degree that they, that troubled firm is not getting cash inflows, suddenly there's a loss of confidence and everyone flees. Everyone wants to pull their money out. That's what happened to Bear Stearns. And as soon as Bear Stearns effectively collapsed, Lehman was in the gun sights of everyone after that because they were the next weak link in the chain. Those two failures are indications that contagion in these markets is a very clear and present danger because there is a tendency not to be willing to make payments to the weak links in the chain. And that's credit risk. That's not market risk. That's all about making sure that I want to be made whole before anyone else is. Good evening. Let's take a two-minute break. Two-minute break, and then we'll be back to start the second section.